Um, so welcome everyone to one more um, very outstanding learning opportunity uh, in the LNOD Roundtables webinar series. Uh, I'm Dr. Sujaya Banerjee. I'm the founder of the Learning in OD Roundtable, and I'm really delighted to present uh, this webinar today to all of you. Um, just for those who don't know about the Learning in OD Roundtable, I'm going to take a couple of seconds to be able to take you through um, what the Learning in OD Roundtable is and what we do. So I'm going to try and flip some of these slides for you. The Learning in OD Roundtable is a not-for-profit community of uh, insightful learners. We uh, started about a decade ago and we've helped HR learning OD talent professionals across five cities to be able to build their capabilities. This is a not-for-profit um, uh, forum. It has over 22,000 members. Um, we've, been, we've been very much at the vanguard of being able to help this community build capabilities, uh, whether practitioners, whether consultants, um, whether researchers, whether academicians. Um, in fact, we ourselves uh, have uh, discussion forums, we have webinars, we have seminars, we carry out annual learning studies. So for those of you who are on the line and are doing great work in the DNI space, our 2020 research study is called the best DNI practices of Asia. So I'm going to encourage you to be able to participate. We, with the current uh, scenario, extended the last dates for entries to the 30th of April, 2020. So I'm going to request you um, to be able to contribute. Uh, we've got Prudel and we've got Thaisin from the uh, forum. And we've also got some of the other consultants who can help you to be able to fill out your entries. So please encourage more people to be able to participate also on our research studies. This is a great time to be able to fill out your entries and put forth the quality of the great work that you do that the rest of the community can learn from. Um, I'm going to try and move forward to be able to share uh, about our governing council members. We've got some really outstanding people who are the wind below our wings, so to speak. You would have recognized a lot of these names, Akil Basrai, uh, Adil Malia, Srinivas Venkatram, Manu Badwa of Sony uh, uh, Entertainment, uh, Dr. Prince Augustine of Mahindra, Rajesh Kamath of Chanak Chanakya Consulting, and Rajesh Urupadhyay, who's going to be our speaker today. So um, we're really excited with the people who are behind being able to put this forum together. We actually offer uh, our masterclasses and discussions and debates and uh, seminars across five cities. So watch out for what's coming up in your city when we are tired of this break. Um, we have lots of options for membership. So uh, those of you who like the quality of things that we are actually delivering. Um, just, just, a quick, uh, just a quick housekeeping piece. If any of you, can you please make sure you all mute it? Can you all please mute it? board are you being able to hear me i think uh, is everyone able to hear uh, sunith is the i hope you unmuted me because i think we got everyone muted because of that noisy um uh, yes i'm able to hear actually at lucknow okay can you please uh, everyone mute your because you you can have noise coming in from your end and as i see we have, uh, you know, over 120 participants on this call, so it will be difficult for us to manage the noise. So if you can just all recheck that you're all on mute. Um, just a bit about our memberships. We've got both individual and corporate memberships. The corporate memberships are for 10 at a time, and these are interchangeable numbers. They're at very nominal rates, and you get very many paid learning events from our academy and what have you at a very, very um, attractive uh, rate. So... I'll contact Trudel and Thessine to know more about these memberships at the end of the uh, call. So I think with that, um, I want to tell you about the forthcoming webinars besides the one we have today. Uh, we've got Prithvi Shegil and he's up tomorrow. We've got uh, Hari Haran talking about challenging times and what we can learn from pe the pestle impact of COVID-19. Um, this one's another not to miss and recommend strongly that you get on um, to be able to hear him. We have Adil Malia talk about leadership traits and the adversity moments. Um, we've got Rajesh Kumar, uh, who's going to be, um, you know, who's going to be talking to us about um, 
Rajesh Kumar, who's going to be talking to us about uh, personal branding and reinventing yourself in turbulent times. And then much later in the month of, um, uh, you know, April, we've got uh, Huilo Toscani, who's going to talk to you about EQ and how it can help us in these very adverse and changing uh, times. Um, I'm going to flip forward. So please register for these. These are free webinars. I can tell you these are outstanding speakers. Getting to hear them for free from home is um, unbelievable uh, opportunity. So please avail of the opportunity to be able to listen to these very outstanding thought leaders. Um, today's talk, and I know there was a lot of interest with this and many of you here from the numbers that have registered, uh, you know, have possibly already heard Professor Upadhyay before. Um, but uh, even for the ones who are coming in on board, uh, the conversation today is around um, wisdom, tradition, and life lessons for just now. So I'm going to repeat that. Wisdom, traditions, and life lessons for just now. I mean, what can be more powerful than what it is that we're all experiencing in terms of unprecedented times? Um, I do consulting for various organizations through Capstone Consulting, and I can tell you that a lot of organizations um, were still scratching their head, figuring what WUCA, what's changed so dramatically, especially for the ones who've been tenured and with the same organization, there was still a degree of doubt on what are we really talking about unprecedented change and turbulence and business turbulence and very different times. And I think that because it's all been happening around us, for a lot of us, we haven't, we failed to be able to connect the dots to be able to spot uh, what has changed so dramatically is kind of taken us in completely, whether it's technology, whether it's changing markets, whether it was the financial meltdown. Uh, there's just been one unprecedented change after another. And then we've been talking about disaster management and we've been talking about pandemics and we've been talking about business continuity for a long time. And suddenly all of this has become a reality for all the organizations. I think all the organizations that have been resisting technology for a very long time have suddenly woken up uh, to the joys of technology, the productivity you can get through virtual working, the whole concept of work from home, which seemed impossible, uh, especially for leaders who still uh, sort of maintain uh, industrial era mindsets, especially in the way in which they believe they can get uh, employees to be productive. So especially in these turbulent adverse times, what else can you reach out to but wisdom tradition? Uh, what else can you count on uh, but insights, deep insights, and life lessons to be able to make meaning, to be able to ask significant questions, to be able to challenge old thinking. And so we thought this was such a powerful topic to present to you, um, especially in these times. And I'm really delighted that you have somebody uh, as knowledgeable and as erudite as uh, Professor Rajesh Urupadhyay doing this uh, webinar for us today. Um, for those of you who don't know Professor Upade, he uh, has several years um, of experience as in, um, both as an academician and as a thought leader. Um, he uh, has taught across international B-schools. Uh, some of you would have perhaps been in his class if, he's, um, if you've been to the Indian School of Business, uh, where he's visiting faculty. Um, Professor Upade runs uh, the uh, Par Excellence organization, he's the director of Par Excellence. And, um, and, and for, for several years now, has been doing outstanding work with the government, non-government organizations, PSUs, and with the private sector, particularly in the space of uh, emotional intelligence. Um, he set up the Academy of Applied Emotional Intelligence, which he is the dean of. And uh, I must say, um, you know, uh, at the end of this webinar, I'm sure you're all going to agree with me that we could not have had a better speaker than this to be able to teach you uh, ancient wisdom tradition. So I think with that, I hand over to Professor Upadhyay. He's using uh, the whiteboard screen uh, as part of the Zoom setup. So don't be alarmed if you're seeing a white screen, but over to you, Professor Upadhyay. Um, we continue asking questions and putting your comments on the chat box. We'll try and use the last few minutes for, uh, for question and answer. I can, um, let me request everyone to switch off their, uh, to be on mute and also you can switch off your videos so that you can use your screens uh, to be able to um, ask questions, post your comments. And uh, with that, um, I'm going to pass hand over um, to Professor Upadhyay. Thank you, uh, Sujaya, for your kind and wonderful introduction. And uh, welcome to this 
today. Our webinar will last for about an hour. And um, I want us to enjoy this entire one hour, largely because it has to do with wisdom traditions. And as you know, in the ancient days, all the learnings were communicated through stories, parables, fables, and the like. So I will begin my session by narrating quite a few stories for you. And each of the stories will have their own reflection value for us. And they will have reflection value at different levels. First of all, depending on where you yourself are psychologically and spiritually located, it will make that meaning to you specifically while making a generic uh, uh, consistent uh, meaning. And um, I will use the whiteboard. I want to put down some thoughts and ideas that I have uh, uh, constructed around the wisdom traditions. I have tried to keep this session as close to a practical application as possible. Although I believe that practical application uh, can be a really good quality if uh, one is theoretically robust and philosophically integrated. So let me begin to tap into some of the popular narratives, uh, uh, mythic narratives of the Romans, Greeks, uh, and of course, ancient India, uh, Hindus, Buddhists, uh, and Jains. If you are to start the story of civilization, it has to start with the story of Prometheus. Prometheus was a Greek titan who kind of did not really like the Greek gods, had a soft corner for human beings. He had a soft corner for human beings who were wallowing in the dark for thousands and thousands of years. Zeus, the top god, had told Prometheus and everybody else that nobody should give fire to man. If you give fire to man, man's civilizational journey will start and he will begin to become equal to the gods. The flip side of becoming equal to the gods is also have uh, the negative of what, or the opposite of whatever the gods and godly is. Prometheus did not listen to Zeus. He secretly stole fire from the gods and gave it to man, thus starting the wheel of civilization, culminating in the reality of today. And one of the realities of today, there are many beautiful realities. One of the realities of today is the coronavirus. But there are many beautiful uh, realities as well. And while the coronavirus seems like an antithesis of something, given the Hegelian dialectics, thesis and antithesis must collide. The purpose of the antithesis is to challenge our operating assumption, be included in the next level of, uh, next level of thesis called the synthesis, bringing about wisdom for the civilization itself. When Prometheus brought the fire to man, and the gods discovered that he had done so, uh, his punishment was very harsh. He was imprisoned by Zeus. He was imprisoned on a very huge rock. His arms and legs were tied, and he was supposed to be there forever. Every evening, a falcon would fly to him, rip his stomach open, and start eating his liver, and eat the liver in its completion, and at the end of that would fly away. This horrifyingly painful event was to happen again and again because through the night the wound would heal and the next day and the next day there would be um, the falcon would return again which means Prometheus's punishment is eternal pain, anguish and imprisonment. The western world saw the start of civilization at least in its mythic narratives as something that was evil. If you're familiar with the story of Adam God had asked Adam not to eat from the fruit of knowledge because knowledge brings with it many corollaries that are unpalatable and unacceptable, at least to the God's worldview. But Adam seems to have transgressed. At least in the biblical narrative, it is not Adam who first ate that fruit of knowledge. People say it's an apple. We don't know whether it was an apple. It is just mentioned as fruit of knowledge. And it seemed that Satan tempted Eve to take a bite of that fruit, which she did. And then she rushed to Adam saying that, Adam, if you eat this fruit of knowledge, you will become as powerful as God. Adam was dismayed, but he had no option because he loved Eve uh, to be condemned with her. And he took a bite. And when he took a bite, with knowledge came the knowledge of shame and guilt. With shame and guilt, you cannot belong to paradise. And they were expelled from paradise forever. 
and God's curse is a lasting curse on man for his disobedience. Disobedience for not maintaining his innocence, for wandering into knowledge that would have contemptual implications. And that very simply was God's curse that when you were in this garden, you could eat your fill anytime as much you wanted. Now you shall eat bread from the sweat of thy brow, and at the end of your wretched days, dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. If you look at the Apple logo, the logo of the Apple, the computer manufacturing company, as Steve Jobs' philosophy is saying that any limit that you set to us, we will transgress. Everything you say can't be done and should not be done, we will do that very thing. And therefore, the logo actually is a bitten apple, which is a power, very powerful resonance with the biblical myth. Then, of course, there is the story of Narcissus. Narcissus was a very, very handsome person. He was so handsome and lovely that people were falling in love with him left, right, and center. And as people fell in love with him, he would reject all their love. On one occasion, it seems, the lady Echo fell in love with him. He rejected her badly. So rejected, she felt that she ran away into the forest and grieved and breathed uh, until she died. And when she died, her body became the forests and her bone became the mountains. Today, if you go amongst the mountains and call out, you will hear an echo. She's still there, pining for Narcissus. On one occasion, a goddess approached Narcissus and expressed her love for him. He rejected her and humiliated her, and the goddess cursed him. And the curse was, may he that does not love others, love him. May he that does not love others, love himself. As you love yourself more and more to the exclusion of everything else, on one occasion, when Narcissus is running, horse riding, he feels very thirsty. He stops at a pool to drink some water. As he bends over to drink water, he sees a beautiful person in the lake. So handsome, beautiful blue eyes, golden hair. He falls in love with this person. And as he tries to reach out to the person, the water shakes and the image gets disturbed. And he pines and pines sitting in the lake until months pass and he dies of exhaustion and starvation. And the goddesses curse, may he that does not love others, love himself, find fruition in such a tragic way. The story of Didalis. Didalis was Professor, can I just interrupt you? Professor, yes. can I interrupt you only for a second? I'm seeing lots of, uh, lots of comments in the chat asking for the PowerPoint. I just want to want to reconfirm to everyone that there isn't PowerPoint. There's only audio. He will take to the whiteboard in some time. So I think I have over 60 comments here asking for the PowerPoint. There is no PowerPoint. He's, you're hearing an audio and he'll take to the whiteboard quick uh, soon. Yeah, just to clarify, because I think there's a, there's a, a tendency to believe that the connection is poor. Right. Uh, thank you, Sujaya, for pointing that out. Yes. And uh, uh, PowerPoints for these stories would be absolutely banal. I think listening to the stories and then imagining them and then going back and reading them up on your own is, 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 is a superior way to find fulfillment here. And um, so I apologize for not uh, putting slides together for this. I thought a greater impact and learning would happen in this dialogic way. And I will use the whiteboard um, to demonstrate some of the frameworks that I think will apply to our context. So the story of Didalis. Didalis was, but if you find that my voice is not clear or I'm too, going too fast or there's something confusing, please point it out in the chat so that I might repeat some of this. So Didalis was an engineer of outstanding capability in the ancient world. And he was so superior. So many of the inventions of the ancient world has been attributed to him. A neighboring king invited Didalis to come and join him in his kingdom and bring his son along, Icarus. And uh, so Icarus and Didalus went to the neighboring kingdom to live there. And uh, things were going very well. People were liking what they were seeing and what Didalus was doing. Didalus was loving it as well. But a strange event happened. The queen of that Uh, there are some people who can't hear. Is there something I can do? 
Sunil. Professor, it's okay. Don't bother yourself with the chat box. You continue. We'll manage that. All right. So just continue. It's absolutely fine. We can hear you. There isn't a PowerPoint. We've clarified that. Please carry on. Professor, please continue. So Didalis was enjoying himself in this particular kingdom when the queen of that kingdom had a particular desire. And the desire involved fornicating with a bull in some variations of the narrative fornicating with a horse. But let's stay with the bull. And when the queen approached Didalis saying that, you know, Didalis, I have this secret desire. Is it possible for you to create the semblance of a male bull? I will hide inside so that the real bull will feel tempted. Sorry, create the semblance of a female bull so that I will hide inside and, um, and the male bull will feel tempted to come. Uh, Didalis was very hesitant and confused and stressed, uh, but he finally agreed to what the queen wanted. The event happened. <coughs> and many months later, a child was born to the queen who was half man and half bull. When the king realized what had happened, he kind of summoned Didalis and exiled him and his son uh, to the middle of a tall tower, in the middle of an island, in the middle of an ocean, to forever uh, be imprisoned and alone and dry and die in solitude, uh, solitary confinement. And uh, Didalis thought that this was terrible. And as months passed, he felt that this is terrible. What can one do? What can one do? How does one, how does one get away from this? But Didalis made some observations. He saw how birds would fly in the sky. And he studied the aerodynamics. He studied all the other details that an engineer's eye would see. And he managed to create for himself and his son a pair of wings. And these wings would help him fly away. And as he put the wings on himself and his son, he said, son, these wings have been put together by a bird's feathers and they are sealed together by wax. I want you to fly away with me. But listen, don't fly too high. If you fly too high, you will approximate the sun the heat of the sun will melt your wax and you will die. And one more thing, don't fly too low. If you fly too low, the waves, the water of the sea will wet the wings and make them damp. And that will again result in your fatality. Here is a parental advice for moderation. And as they take off, Didalis's son, Icarus, is unable to regulate and control his emotions. He flies higher and higher, even though his father screams and calls out to him. He flies higher and higher, and the wax melt, and Icarus falls to his fatality. Didalis' myth and Icarus' myth itself have deep resonances for us on what comprises transgression, what comprises convenient steps being taken for a larger damage, and what comprises unbridled aspirations. There's a story of Sisyphus. Sisyphus was a Greek character who was cursed by the gods to forever roll a large boulder up a hill. And this was a punishment for something he had done. When the god of death, Thanatos, approached him, saying that your time is up, come with me, Sisyphus kind of cheated him and escaped. On one other occasion, he used his wife to get out of the clutches of death. When Zeus found this out, the punishment to Sisyphus was, you shall roll up a boulder of rock up the mountain every day and as you reach the peak the boulder will roll down and the next day you have to roll it back up for the boulder to roll down again and your punishment again is eternal and therefore now what you need to do is roll it up and roll it down the only solace will be you will not remember that you had rolled this up yesterday now look at the myth of sisyphus albert camus wrote a albert camus wrote a novel called The Myth of Sisyphus saying, modern man and modernity is exactly like the myth of Sisyphus. We are all like Sisyphus, every day laboring again and again. All our tomorrows are unexamined repetitions of yesterday. And we are trapped into the Sisyphus dilemma. Steve Jobs in his graduating speech to graduating students made a comment that you can escape the Sisyphus destiny 
by following your heart, by following your bliss, doing what you think needs to be done, regardless of whether it is approved and applauded by others. And he said the Maha Mantra to living a non Sisyphus life is to stay hungry and stay foolish. If you come on this side of the wisdom traditions, on the side you have the story of Trishanku. Trishanku was a king who left his kingdom, went to meditate in the forest. And on one occasion, he had this deep desire to enter heaven in his mortal body. So he went to Sage Vashishta and says, can you send me to heaven? And Sage Vashishta said, in your mortal body, you cannot be sent. Sage Vashishta refused him. Trishanku went to another, to his children, to Vashishta's children and said, you know, your dad is not that good. Maybe you guys are better in your spiritual powers. Maybe you can send me up and I will make you famous and I will make you rich. When the sons of the Rishi saw that this was a bad, poor political game this man was playing, they cursed him. And they cursed him with all sorts of diseases and they cursed him to wander around and then to work in a crematorium. While he worked in the crematorium for a while, on one occasion, Sage Vishwamitra passed that way and Vishwamitra told him that I can send you to heaven. And using his spiritual powers, Vishwamitra sent Trishanku to heaven. As he was about to enter the heaven, the gods pushed him out. And Vishwamitra held him in midair. And the dynamics of the two forces inverted Trishanku. And forever, Trishanku is near the heaven but not in it. And he's hanging upside down. And this is his destiny for this whole yuga. Meaning Trishanku's aspirations were in excess of his abilities and deservedness. And Trishanku, therefore, shall remain hanging upside down for an entire yuga. The, met the metaphorical meaning of this hanging upside down is you must relook look at everything that you are doing, challenge all your operating assumptions, acquire an insight uh, that comes from challenging all your assumptions, and then you will have acquired the ability and the deservedness to enter heaven. That's a powerful story of Trishanku. Then there's the story of Yayati. Yayati was a king. And he had a hundred sons. And when he was about uh, uh, when he was about to die, Yama had come saying that your time is up. And Yayati said, you know, I'm still not done enjoying the pleasures of the world. So please don't take me. And Yama said, well, I can take somebody else in your place. And Yayati approached his sons. He had a hundred sons. He says, which one of you are willing to trade your youth with my old age? And nobody stepped forward but the youngest son. And this got repeated many times, it seems. For a thousand years, Yayati enjoyed the pleasures of the world. And at the end of the thousand years, when Yama came again, he said, I think I'm now ready to go. I don't need the pleasures of the world. Only in retrospect, I realize that my first son was right. That frugality is the purpose and the meaning through which we must live our lives so that we're always living for a higher purpose. Now, if you look at all these myths, and there are many more, if you look at all these myths, they're finally bringing us to something that we have struggled with always. And that is the dilemma between being and having. Eric Fromm wrote a book, To Have or To Be. To have means to acquire power, to acquire knowledge, to acquire wealth, uh, to acquire um, all the conveniences and comforts of the world. And to be is to add value to yourself, knowledge and wisdom and learning for yourself. And as you be, you become. The dilemma between being and having is a paramount dilemma. So if you are trapped in human having, the human being is trapped in human having that he must continuously have. If he has to have, then he has to pay for the have and therefore he's trapped in human doing. The kind of schizophrenia we experience, a spiritual separateness from our own selves, has to do with the idea of the human being has stopped being, the human being has become human having, and therefore is trapped in human doing. And very often, the work that we do kind of pushes us in the direction of what needs to be done rather than what we desire to do deeply for our own internal spiritual satisfaction. So if I were to draw that diagrammatically, when we are born, our desire to be, being, and becoming are coincident. 
this is being, this is becoming. A coincidence. As we grow and become teenagers and pass through exams and engineering colleges and MBA programs, what we want to do to succeed in society and what we want to be, our own being, begin to become separate. This is the direction of separateness. Your being and becoming are being separated and there is exhaustion. There is fatigue. As time passes, the separateness becomes so extensive that it can result in social anxiety, non-fulfillment, boredom, depression, routine. When you are being and becoming a separate, it's problematic. The solution to this lies in reflection, thinking, revisiting your aspirations, figuring out what is it that you want to do, what is the purpose of your life, what is the purpose of what you are pursuing, what do you really want to do, what do you want to achieve, how do you want to relate to people, how are you going to give full fruition to your own aspirations and meanings, what are you going to do? Now, if you think about it, fortunately for many people, you're forced to do, do some of that. Many of us who are running like headless chicken, many of us who are exhausted, but we are carrying on on the treadmill of our lives. For many of us, all of our tomorrows were repetitions of our yesterdays. In fact, many years in our lives have gone blank. What happened in the whole of last year? What happened in the whole of 2017, 18, 2013, 14? And it could be a blur because there is not much difference. You're doing it only for the reason of having and not being. For, for reasons of becoming and not being. Becoming has to do with achievement, success, or social applaud and approval. We so badly need to be admired by other people that can we be trapped into the dilemma of becoming, ignoring being. And this is the state at which we must now enter and ask many questions that challenge our assumptions. Ask questions on, am I skilled enough? Is the new environment and the demands of the new environment, am I up to it? What's lacking in me? How can I scale up? How can I expand? How can I get involved with different aspects of my own personality? By asking those questions, reflecting on those questions, by renewing ourselves, by building greater internal vitality and strength, intellectual acumen, wisdom, by building satisfying relationships, it is possible, it is possible to relook at all that we are doing to become by ignoring being. <coughs> One simple way to do that is to draw a circle, writing out everything that you love to do. To harvest the energies of being, one has to love what you do. What all do you love to do? Then look at what all are you good at doing? This overlapping area of what you love to do and what you're good at doing is basically the space in which exhaustion will not happen, in which there is energizing. Effort becomes effortless because you're good at doing and you love to do. Enter dimension three. If you're good at doing and you love to do, whose life is becoming better as a result of you being there? Whose life is becoming easier? Who is being helped? As you ask that question, that from what I love to do and what I'm good at doing, what all does the world need? And world might be my world, my personal world, could be my country, my society, could be mankind. You find a very interesting triangulation there. And this part is, what do I love to do? What am I good at doing? And what the world needs? This becomes the space of being. As you look at the space that becomes being, let me draw that diagram again. 
this space, there is a book in the market which talks about this space. It's called Ikigai. 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 What you are good at doing, what you love to do, and what the world needs. What the world needs. This is Ikigai. What does the world need? You give what the world needs, and this is sustainable. Once you're operating from this centrality, over a period of time, your diagram begins to look like being and becoming. First being and becoming are becoming closer. And then finally, being and becoming are coincident. That means being feeds into becoming and becoming feeds into being. And both are simultaneous. Therefore, they are reinforcing each other. And I would like to call this perpetual dynamic equilibrium. Perpetual dynamic equilibrium. Uh, at this stage, let me introduce a new idea to you. And that new idea is this whole distance. Although I've said it in just a few minutes, it might take very long. It might take months, years. And in the Hindu worldview, it might take many births. What we are saying is when you are human doing so that you can human having, the human doing and human having, you're doing for your children, you're doing for your wife, you're doing for uh, the society you're doing for your boss while you are doing you are trapped into into trapped into doing trapped into having when you are doing and having you are trapped in that space to break out of that space not to ignore yourself not dharma what you are doing is dharma what you need to do is swadharma which means at the heart of that is you you cannot function and grow in spiritual wisdom or in wisdom per se you cannot encourage your own ikigai if you have not, first of all, participated in self-care, self-focus, trying to focus on your own personal adequacy. Focusing on your personal adequacy has a 12-step formula, 12 steps. And uh, this is the only part of the presentation that could have gone on slides. But don't worry about that. The internet is full of these 12 steps. What they notice that if you look at heroic characters from either ancient times or medieval times or modern times, whether you look at Mandela or Gandhi or Steve Jobs or Venkataswamy, no matter who you look at, you will notice that their journey of transformation moves from business as usual <coughs> right through personal transformation. And the personal transformation happens through 12 steps. I'm going to just mention the steps very briefly and encourage you to go and visit these in your own time. Step one, it is business as usual. Life is normal. Life is average. Life is boring. Life comprises like everything, every day. Mrinal Sen used to call it Ak Din, Pruti Din. That means one day is every day. In this ordinary world, while you're living this ordinary world, there is an inner, inner component that feels ignored. There is a splinter in your brain, like he says in Matrix. There is some inner thing that is not satisfied. Everything does not seem to be okay. You have the bank balance, you have the car, you have the right address, you have a wonderful family, and yet there is an internal chaos, an internal anguish, uh, undeciphered and undecipherable. Now, I teach some of the programs at INSEAD. I teach some of the programs uh, uh, for uh, really people who have 15 to 20 years of experience in part-time MBA programs. And one of their concerns is now what? I have got everything on, on a list of things to be socially successful and applaudable, but now what? It's not enough. The ordinary world is where you've lived your life. Now you need to move out of the ordinary world into the un unknown world. Whatever is that deep desire, cultivate it. Step out into the unknown. Figure out what your aspirations are and step out, take risks. As you step out into the world, <coughs> it will seem like destiny calling. The destiny is calling out to you. Destiny is calling out. There is something deeper. It seems to be more fulfilling, more engaging, but more anxiety filling, more insecurity, more fears, more uncertainty. You stepped out, you're at the edge of the cliff. There is an inner thing that's saying leap from the cliff. Leap and you'll be able to fly. And all your experience and senses say nonsense, don't leap. For those of you who watched the film Matrix 
as Morpheus tries to guide Neo to come back. Neo is afraid and does not. He gets arrested by the police. But at this stage, if you were to take the step forward, most human beings will come back. Most human beings will come back. They'll say, I tried. It didn't work. No, that's too problematic. No, no, I don't want to do that. I realized that's not what I wanted. But all these are masks. They did not have the courage to persist with their inner aspirations. You can either belong to the 5% that makes for civilizational transformation and contribution, or you can make for 95% that comprises the middle of the bell curve of humankind. But as you step out, there is a tendency to refuse the call, but you overcome that tendency as you step out and you go really into the wilderness, you will find that there are many people who come to help. You'll find that there are many resources. In fact, if you leap from the cliff, you'll be baffled and surprised as to how many safety nets are already there. If only you took your step, the cosmos would take its step to kind of nurture and nourish you and fulfill your own and enable your own actualization. This is the journey of self-actualization, not the journey of compliance, not the journey of organizational life. An organizational life, an organizational man uh, in his authentic journey has to step outside the boundaries of safety and security. When you meet the mentor, when you read a book, when you listen to a story, an event happens, they challenge your assumptions, provide insights, provide alternate perspectives. And this gives you the energy to move on. And as you move on, you now cross the threshold where there are many difficulties, many challenges, many battles, there are dragons, there are fightings, there is scarcity, all kinds of things will happen. And as you engage with them, the toughest fights that you fight, uh, fighting a dragon as it is called, Carl Gustav Jung called it fighting with your own shadow. As you fight with the dragons and you defeat the dragons, immense amount of wealth is made available to you. In some British myth, this wealth, this richness, you bring back to the people. This wealth is also a metaphor for wisdom. What wealth did Buddha bring? When he went out, he was Siddhartha. When he came back, he is Buddha, he is Gautama. When a person from Gujarat goes to South Africa, he goes as a lawyer. He comes back as a revolutionary uh, with the capability of transforming the world. Not to forget that Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi was a contemporary of Adolf Hitler. And both had absolutely different worldviews. And 70 years later, you now realize who was most successful. So that ordeal, that fight, that suffering has the power to transform you, which means there is a metaphorical death of your old self and the new self has emerged. And as the new self emerges, the new self comes back to society with that knowledge, with that wealth, with that wisdom to come and give back to society so that you can transform people. You can touch, move and inspire others. Other people's life becomes better because you come back transformed. You come back actualized. You come back more fulfilled. Your compassion, your empathy, your love, your giving flows from an inner abundance. If you look at Steve Jobs when he got thrown out of uh, Apple and he said, I wanted to run away. And then he said, fortunately, there was the lightness of newness and not the heaviness and the burden of success. And his transformation to happens. And Apple part two is very different from Apple part one. And at the center of that is Steve Jobs. His own hero's journey, which is the 12th step, is there is resurrection, there is renewal, there is a new man comes back to society to give. <coughs> now what I say, I want to say, is that as you begin to take up this journey to find out your own Ikigai, it'll pass through these steps. So have audacity, have hope, have optimism, and have courage and move forward to becoming more successful. And I want to put forward a diagrammatic representation of what will be required for you to be successful. And this, this particular diagram is going to be a little crowded, so bear with me. At a later point of time, if I convert these two slides, I will have it sent to everybody who's been on this webinar. So I'm saying if you are that person who wants self-transformation, who wants growth, who wants to really benefit from the wisdom traditions, then first of all, you must have a mind that looks at falsifiability. Falsifiability is basically an unwillingness to be trapped by your past, not to be trapped by your past success, by your past failures, not to be trapped by where you are. 
to challenge operating assumptions your own assumptions you must value uh, diversity you must navigate different points of view oppositions values incongruence you need to lead an expanded life not only a life that is dictated by the realities and the limitations of a cubicle and a performance appraisal form that can be a stepping stone to something much greater it cannot be an end in itself organizations today will offer you everything that you need and this is the faustian dilemma everything that you need is available there and that's a great place to start it's not a great place to stop you must grow mature and move out and challenge operating assumptions falsifiability the second one i want to talk about is frugality frugality means to do with less it is foolish to do with more where less will suffice design thinking kaizen continuous incremental improvement your own life if you look at the maslow's hierarchy of needs if you think about it actually the maslow's hierarchy of needs is the hierarchy of greeds is the hierarchy of dependencies to move to the actualization component you cannot get trapped at the ego level or at the consumption level or at the esteem level frugality generates the vitality and the energy to the move to the next level of sophistication the for frugality the third one has to do with a idea by taleb and it's called anti fragility anti fragile anti fragile is an interesting idea anti fragile very simply means that you acquire the ability to be stronger with opposite with uh, opposition difficulty challenges pain and hurt for example when you train for doing a marathon as you run the more difficult the more challenge you become stronger and triumphant if i were to take a glass glass and fling it on the floor it will crash and break i might get an unbreakable glass and i throw it on the floor a couple of times and then finally it will also break because there is internal fatigue but can you imagine a glass that as you throw onto the floor it bounces back stronger than it previously was in a vuca environment in an environment like the one we are finding ourselves an ability to be anti fragile is one of the lessons of the wisdom traditions then you must have a, what i call emotional maturity so falsifiability frugality anti fragility emotional maturity but these while these are the main pillars there are some sub pillars that i would like to look at between falsifiability and frugality there is need to acquire greater knowledge greater understanding and what you need to look at here is learning agility learning agility which looks at enhancing your self awareness which looks at mental agility people agility change agility results agility which means if you are going to challenge your operating assumptions and reject them in favor of better set of assumptions the better set of assumptions will emerge from being able to learn in an agile manner between frugality and anti frugality and anti fragility i want to put the idea not of learning agility but emotional agility emotional agility i will look at emotional agility in some greater detail i will look at emotional maturity in some greater detail right over here i want to put the idea of authentic actualization authentic actualization is basically the hero's journey finding your own ikigai and then finally not the least is the idea of happiness and happiness in the english language is a very weak word i want to look at happiness as ananda so i'm going to take emotional maturity emotional agility and ananda to unpack them in greater details so let's look at emotional maturity emotional maturity has emotional self awareness as a concept are you aware of your emotions are you aware how emotions will influence your thoughts and actions and then impact your actions and how your impact 
uh, how your actions will impact others are you aware of that that is emotional self awareness are you able to control your impulses do you operate from the neocortex or do you operate from your limbic system unbridled are you able to regulate your emotions are you able to solve problems in situations where emotions are involved it is not to do with tools and techniques of solving problems but understanding emotions that play out in the act of solving the problems are you able to listen empathically and then meaningfully assert are you humble are you humble emotional maturity is very predicated on humility but humility itself has two components one is appreciative orientation and the other is gratitude so emotionally mature people will not only know the impact they are having on others emotional self awareness regulate their own emotions and say what is appropriate solve problems by listening and understanding first demonstrate humility which means appreciation and gratitude and then finally demonstrate incredible will emotional maturity means you will not give up they will stay with the problem until it is solved so when there is will there is bound to be optimism and there is bound to be the idea of resilience which i would prefer to call hardiness so this is emotional maturity let me now take a look at emotional agility there is some literature on emotional agility but it is not covered very well emotional agility has to do with can you perceive emotions in yourself and others can you use emotions for example i might be feeling very anxious and stressed and angry just now can i figure out that given the context given the situation given the people given the problem anxiety anger uh, stress is not the right emotions to have in that situation i should be able to snap out of my present mood as it were my present emotional state and get and immerse myself into the new emotional state that will be more appropriate for solving the problem at hand or at dealing with people at hand so using emotions has to do with deliberately snapping out of sub optimal grooves of emotional thinking to optimal grooves of emotional thinking so not to be slave to your emotions but rather choose to be masters of them it's a cliche i know but using your emotion this is what it means then you have do you understand your emotions and understand your emotions understand the emotions of others and can you manage your emotions and emotions of others i am told i have about 10 minutes left well 5 minutes let me look at the idea of happiness happiness so i am going to call it ananda and for literature on ananda i think going back to the ancient indian texts is about as as fulfilling and as rewarding it can get for ananda i would like you to look at two frameworks one is to look at the panchamaya kosha taken from the taittiriya upanishad and the other is to look at ashtanga yoga of patanjali panchamaya kosha says your body is made up of food annamaya kosha annamaya kosha is the basic physical body the food that you eat the exercises that you do the disciplines that you have is annamaya kosha the next one is pranamaya kosha the pranamaya kosha makes the annamaya kosha alive therefore the need to do pranayama and keep yourself oxygenated the third one is the manomaya kosha mano is the emotional sheath the emotional disturbances therefore there is need for emotional stability emotional maturity emotional stability and emotional maturity is the domain of manomaya kosha and then there is vigyana maya kosha vigyana maya kosha basically means operating from your ikigai operating from what you love to do what are you good at doing and you are serving the world there is a greater purpose to your life 
when you wake up in the morning there are other people's life will be fulfilled because you are about to do something that's the vigyanamay kosha when all of these koshas are in alignment what you will experience is ananda anandamay kosha while this is the framework for reaching ananda the technology for reaching ananda is ashtanga yoga of patanjali which is yama niyama asana pranayama pratyahara dharana dhyana samadhi samadhi very simply means being in a state of emotional balance being in a state of emotional stability what the bhagavad gita calls sthita pragya and aligned with anandamay kosha this one is the framework where you must approach your personal transformation at a physical level at an energy level at an emotional level at an ikigai purpose level so that you can reach ananda and the technology for doing that is right here patanjali's ashtanga yoga and this is the technology for driving happiness so ananda mai kosha while there is a lot of literature on uh, a lot of literature on happiness in 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 positive psychology they are useful and handy but right at the bottom the most enriching one that i have found are the ones that i have just mentioned over here this is the right time to stop and take questions but let me conclude by saying what we have done is looked at mythic narratives looked at what heroic journeys are what lessons they may have for us and as i said the lessons for us is lessons for the individual and the lesson for the individual is stop take stock relook reexamine recheck your real aspirations as against your pretentious aspirations and create your ikigai and to create your ikigai you need to have a certain kind of a mind the mind that looks at challenging assumptions operates frugally is resilient and anti fragile is emotionally mature at the same time has learning agility emotional agility and chases authentic actualization all of this so that you can acquire happiness if you were to put emotional intelligence and the purpose of emotional intelligence if you were to put productivity on the x axis and happiness on the y axis you would get low low high high you would get a diagram that says high happiness and high productivity is the real purpose of our pursuit here today from wisdom traditions with a caveat happiness first if you are happy just now you will be more productive and more successful therefore do not sacrifice your today for a greater tomorrow a greater today will give you a superior tomorrow thank you people for listening to me so attentively i would be glad to field some questions in the next five or so minutes remaining can i request you to put your comments or questions into the chat box and uh, we'll request rajeshwar to try and answer one or two go ahead everyone anyone would like to ask questions is a question here from uh, akil um outstanding presentation so can you suggest a few baby steps to start on a new journey uh, baby steps no akil doesn't need baby steps akil is halfway there himself but um, you know i i think um, akil it's a good idea to look at uh, that book ikigai and then kind of personalize the application uh, for yourself Uh, i am very sure that you already on your journey on this journey quite a bit but relook at the idea of ikigai and you know i'll be glad to chat uh, offline if you need to do but ikigai is a good place to start okay there's somebody else saying can you explain the last matrix one more time yes the last matrix is i'm going to put productivity on the x axis and happiness in the y axis i'm going to put low low and high high so i get a 2 by 2 quadrant now if you are neither happy nor productive that is the definition of hell if you are very productive and unhappy you going to burn out and become ash if you are very happy and unproductive well it's not sustainable so the only real space to be in is high happiness and high productivity and i am saying for high happiness and high productivity to get started and to be sustainable happiness acquires priority so happiness first okay we've got uh, uh so we've got uh, another question here are all great leaders learned 
um, gone through these 12 steps formally? Do you think that great leaders typically know of these 12 steps or do they anyway sort of demonstrate these 12 steps? So um, all great leaders and successful leaders would have gone through these steps whether or not they knew them as those steps. But I have a feeling that once you are a great leader and great is a word I will presume certain adjectives there that means you're self-aware and if you're self-aware then you will know that there is a certain template uh, in which the personal transformation happens at least in ancient Indian wisdom traditions that template is extremely clearly laid out what Joseph Campbell has said and done in his hero's journey is culled out from a variety of myths from all over the world including India and said my god all these people's personal transformation can finally be reduced to these 12 steps. And therefore for us is an opportunity to reverse engineer uh, the transformation and apply it to our own lives. Look at where am I dissatisfied? Don't let it go. Don't suffer silently. Ask questions, take risks, step out. The worst case scenario can't be so bad. And the best case scenario is so transformative. And um, so uh, the upside is so high that I think it's worth it to step out of your comfort zone. Okay. I think um, there's, there's one, a couple of questions coming up, uh, but I'll just take one last one, which is you talked about Gandhi and Hitler. You said only one of them won. My question according to you is which one won and most importantly, how? So let's see what happened. So what are the after effects of Gandhi in India? What's the after effect of Gandhi in South Africa and other parts of the world? I'm told uh, in, in one of the Middle Eastern countries, there is somebody called, some boy called uh, Gandhi something, Gandhi Abdullah, Gandhi something, who's trying to bring about transformation. So what Gandhi did is gave psychological freedom to the Indians. What Gandhi gave is a sense of pride, uh, provided nonviolence as an instrument, harm, uh, reduction, compassion, empathy. What Hitler said is dominance, world. Six, kill six million Jews. Germany got destroyed. Eastern and Western Europe got destroyed. In retrospect, if you look at the outcomes of what both these people manage at their personal levels, I think Gandhi was uh, uh, a success. But the default benefits of uh, Adolf Hitler um, are also substantial. But if you really want an analysis of Adolf Hitler, Eric Fromm has written a book called The Anatomy of Human Destructiveness, where he kind of points out how Adolf Hitler's deepest desire was necrophilia. And uh, that is an interesting variation. But I can see how people can have objections to some of what Gandhi said and did. But you know, every mind, like a biography of Hitler starts by saying, uh, the biography of every great man, like the biography of Adolf Hitler, is the biography of his times. Adolf Hitler is not a person. Adolf Hitler was a phenomenon. Which means if not this particular Adolf Hitler, somebody else would have emerged because the operating context was so intense that it would produce somebody who would do things that got done. And therefore in the finest analysis, you know, there are no real villains, but lessons for each one of us is to finally uh, contribute Parupakar to do good, to spread Ananda with ourselves and with others. And in retrospect, in my view, in my assessment, Gandhi fits the bill. I would choose Gandhi any day over Adolf Hitler. Right. Um, Rajesh, any resources you can recommend to people, especially around Panchmai Kosha? Where could they read more about this? Uh, so Panchmai Kosha, um, um, you can go to, so the Wikipedia will throw up something on Ashtanga Yoga and Panchmai Kosha and, um, and the internet too. And from there, you can start your journey. You know, the Panchmai Kosha is taken from the Taitriya Upanishad. And um, you can go to the Upanishad, but uh, none of the Upanishads can be read. They all have to be studied. That means you will need a teacher to teach that. And um, so uh, go to the internet, go to these sources, try and listen to people who are talking about it and start your journey and your own inner dynamism, magnetism and desire will propel you in, in the right direction of choice. Great. All right. I think with that, we're going to thank Thank you, uh, Rajeshwar. Lots of thank yous to you in the chat box here for an incredible session. Um, so thank you. This was literally one, one insight uh, per 30 seconds kind of conversation. So thank you for this. And uh, thank you everyone for logging in. Very quickly, our announcements. You have a webinar coming up tomorrow, same time, 4 to 5. Uh, this time offered by Prithvi Shegil. And he's going to be talking to you about transformational leadership and uh, 
uh, in turbulent times. We've got a very interesting session day after tomorrow as well. So recommend strongly that you get on to that. We've got a list of our webinars which are out there um, you know, on our websites. Um, I'm, uh, they're also up on the screen right now. You've got the one on personal branding that you must not miss. Uh, we don't have more than 200 seats on any of these webinars. So make sure you block your seat very quickly and uh, look forward to having you use this downtime in a meaningful way. I know many of you have are um, you know have been tasked with keeping the learning curve steep during um, the lockdown period. So I'm going to recommend strongly that you popularize these webinars inside your own organizations as well, and uh, and get people to be able to use these resources. These are all outstanding thought leaders. You would in, in ordinarily not get a chance to listen to them for free. So I recommend strongly that you rec that you use these opportunities well and make them available to people from within your organization as well. Um, lastly, just two, uh, two more announcements. The best diversity inclusion practices of Asia. Um, do participate. We have 13 categories. Please participate by sharing best practices from your own organization. If you need help to put your entries together, we're happy to be able to support you with that. And um, last but not the least, be a member of the Learning and OD Roundtable. Uh, please respond. Reach out to Prudel. Reach out to Thaisin, and they'll be happy to be able to help you with discounted property member and get access to all our academy and other programs and learning resources at, uh, at, at huge discounts and, and many free passes to, to seminars and the other things coming up uh, during the course of the year. So good luck, everybody. Have a great afternoon and uh, see you all tomorrow at 4 p.m. at the next webinar. All the best, everyone. Stay safe. Right. Thank you very much.